Um, so hopefully, no doubt in anybody's mind, um, again, to, re to remind everybody the, the multivitamin, which was organic, plant-based, said lab tested on it, very benign supplement, turned out to have one ten thousandth of one dose. So basically, this drug, LGD4033, is taken in a pill form, usually a milligram or two, and one ten thousandth was what was what was located in the capsule and it correlated perfectly to the levels that were in his urine sample, um, which ranged, you know, right around the 50 picogram range. So, you know, not only did it provide, you know, a perfect, very clear answer, but it also gave us a lot of, you know, confidence in this threshold issue that um, we're putting forward uh, because, you know, this is exactly what we don't want to do is punish someone and stop someone from fighting when they have these ultra low levels that are giving them unequivocally, and that, that was the word from the USADA scientists, unequivocally no performance enhancing benefit. Yeah, I think part of the confusion was, I mean, as you said, you're, you're kind of implementing these thresholds, yep. but they haven't really been publicly announced yet, and so it kind of feels a little bit from the outside like, you know, are, are we making this up as we go along? So, I mean, are, are there plans to, to announce these changes more, more publicly so that, so that we know they're available? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's going to be next week. And look, the reason why we haven't done that is we want to be as comprehensive as possible. We are scouring over the approximately 13,000 tests we've done in this program looking at the positives, talking to other professional sports leagues, talking to some of the scientists who actually invented some of these substances. So we want to be as thorough as possible. Luckily, from an optics standpoint, we had Neil Magny out in California on the 15th of that stakeholder meeting, and he talked exactly about this issue and this same substance. So I think that shows that, look, this wasn't you know treating Nate special because he's the main event for the BMF belt. Um, so that was two days before USADA notified us of that initial, you know, low level. So the 15th, Magni was out in California, talked about this issue, and then the 17th, two days later, is when we first learned about me. I, I know you said you didn't do anything, you know, differently or unique because it was made of it, but it was done really, really fast. I know you guys worked hard on timing, but can other fighters expect that type of, you know, expeditious nature of, of handling? Yeah, I mean, we're absolutely, and that myself and Donna Marcolini, that's what we do, and that's kind of the beauty of having an independent administrator administrator of your program is it frees us up to be an advocate for the athlete, to be eyes and ears so that when something like ha this happens, we can, you know, put our, our stuff into, into action. Um, yeah, I mean, look, if anyone's, you know, criticizing us for all hands on deck getting this done quick for a main event fight, okay, you know, bring that on. That's just a reality. But every other fighter on the roster is going to get our help and our services just like, you know, we did with Nate in this case. And lastly, for me, Jeff, uh, you said you're looking at all 13,000 tests. And that's what they, I've had some, seen some fighters wondering, if, would there be any retroactive, you know, look at previous cases? Of course, suspensions that have been handled have been handled. There's nothing you can do, but yeah. you could potentially clear somebody's name, right? By, by saying, you know what, these in the past were considered positives. We don't consider the positives anymore, so we're, we're wiping the slate. Is that something that would be looked at? Yeah, pot potentially. Um, there's, you know, provision in our in our policy called Lex Meteor, and it basically gives you the benefit of any rule changes retroactively. Um, so that's a possibility. Yeah, I mean, it's it's difficult. Look, we're we're acting as facts as we can, but you know, I know it's cliche, but it's true. We go on the best science available at the time, and two, three years ago, we just didn't have the science here, and that's what we've been doing, you know, over this last year. I mean, I think I first spoke about the issue of thresholds publicly when I did Rogan last December. So again, this is this is no secret. This is not, for those of you thinking that, this is not because this is Nate Diaz and the BMF title. This was in the works for you know almost a year now. Uh, the World Anti-Doping Agency, or WADA, under whose prohibited list we operate, they've had a working group, and this is public knowledge, for about the last year looking at this threshold issue. They haven't come to an agreement yet. We basically said, look, we can't wait any longer. This is absolutely the right thing to do. We keep seeing this more and more. We live in a more and more contaminated world. We're going to continue to see it more, and we need to do something immediately. And Jeff, to make it clear, um, it, was, it was two samples that the LGD 433 showed up in, right? Three samples, actually. Three samples. Yeah, okay. and, I, and I know you were talking about the, uh, the timeline, so yeah. let me kind of get that to you guys here. So on the, the first collection was done on uh, October 9th. Um, we had CSAC where we talked about this issue publicly yeah. on the 15th. The 17th was the initial positive. Um, that showed positive for some of the metabolite. Um, very low level under that one one thousandth of the pooled concentration of urine that we talked about in California. Um, that same night, USADA got another collection from him. 
And that's what happens when these cases come down. I tell fighters, the more tests you get, if you're not doing anything on purpose, they're your friend. Now, if you're cheating, you don't want to be tested more. But if you're not, the more data points that we can gather, the better. So that's why they sent someone out on the night of the 17th. Um, that result came back with a parent compound of about 50 picograms. Um, then they did another collection. Um, that date was the, I think, 22nd. And that came back with 49 picograms. Um, again, based on, you know, you s talking to Nate, when he was taking this multivitamin, it, it matched perfectly. And we waited, and we did this on purpose, and I know Nate came out publicly this week and said, look, UFC told me not to talk about this. Um, he was asked who it was and didn't say, well, you, I was the one that talked to him. And I'll tell you exactly what I said. I said, look, we've changed our policy now where we don't publicly announce things. We have this threshold for this substance. I think you're going to fall under. So look, if you don't want it out there, then I wouldn't tell anybody or not talk about that. Anyone who insinuates that that means we weren't going to tell the commission, that is absolutely false. The minute that first positive test came in, I called Hunter, who I report to, Dana was brought in, and we started talking about, okay, we need to get the commission as much data as possible. Let's wait until we accumulate it all, and that's exactly what happened. And uh, Hunter said this, and I think Kim Sumwer, the executive director, has verified it, that he that reached out to her before you know, Nate went public with this, so they were in that loop. And then when when did uh, when was the first time that Nate was informed that something might might be wrong? So I mean, it was when we heard of the first test on the 17th. Um, it was through his team, uh, but yeah, that was when he found out. And then and then Nate goes public with it last Thursday, and, yep. and you know all of us are, are freaking out. Um, what's going on behind the scenes with you guys? At that so point? that night. Um, the supplements he was using were at the laboratory and uh, being tested, and I got the call at, uh, I think it was four in the morning, uh, which would have been Friday by this point, right. saying that we found it. They actually found it on the last, it was the same supplement, but the last two that they put on the machine. So the, the scientists were like a little frustrated. They're like, oh, what are the odds it's gonna be, you know, these last two, and yeah. it turned out there it was. It lit up like a Christmas tree. That's something with these substances, these SARMs. Ironically, they're very, very easy to detect. The scientists uh, told me, look, if you're an athlete trying to cheat, this, these would not be the substances you'd want to use because the term is they light up like a Christmas tree on the machines that they use to detect them. There's m many other substances out there, and I won't talk about them because I don't want to lay a blueprint down, but would be very difficult to detect. And you know, I have 20 years of experience talking with athletes, knowing what those protocols look like, and, and SARMs aren't any part of those protocols. And this was the Smyrna Lab in Salt Lake City, right? Correct. The water right. approved right. Dr. Reichner. Yep. And then as soon as, soon as it comes back that it was indeed the pain and supplement at 4 a.m. Yep. Uh, is that is that the moment where it's like all right, Nate, you know, Nate is pretty much clear. We waited for we had to wait for one more thing. That third test, those results oh, okay. came back on Friday afternoon, and that's why I know a lot of you guys were asking for you know a statement, and we wanted to get all that data in. What we didn't want to see obviously is this number spike up, you know, above that threshold because that would have been a different right. circumstance. But it was obviously well under, and once we had that, uh, we put the statement out. What would have happened if it came over that? Threshold? Yeah, I mean, it probably would consider it a you know. A an adverse test, um, you know, I, I don't know. I think what this does really well is verify that those numbers that we've set are appropriate. Um, because, you know, one ten thousandth of a dose, what if it was double or triple that? That's still a very, very small amount. I think would still fall under that 100 picogram um, level. So I, I feel pretty comfortable with it. Is there any chance of a positive test on the commission? Uh, yeah, I mean, look, that's that's something people, you know, criticize. There's, you know, criticism of this program out there. In the old days, we would have run into real trouble, I think, because commissions would have been doing testing using the same laboratories with the same level of sensitivity. And this isn't a knock on the commissions, but unless you do this full time and study these things like, you know, USADA who runs our program like we do, it's difficult to get an understanding of it. So, I mean, I would guess if we didn't have this program, you'd be seeing quite a few positive tests on the commission level at very low levels. And again, no fault of theirs, just probably wouldn't be knowledgeable enough to see that, hey, if we have this issue, and there would be, you know, suspensions left and right. So, you know, it's, it's an interesting kind of dynamic that this program's in place, obviously, to catch cheaters, but what it's actually doing now, I think, is protecting, you know, unintentional ingesters of these prohibited substances. But in competition, like, if, if, 
it's flagged at all by the commission. They can act independent of USADA, correct? They can, but you know that that was part of the purpose of going out to California, and there, there's good momentum, I think, from at least the major commissions and even the head of the ABC that we realize, and we talked about this in California, uniformity is key here, right? It doesn't do us any good to have these thresholds and some commission comes in and says, wait, no, we don't adhere to those. That's a positive test under our rules. So that's a big part of what we've been doing and maybe part of the reason for delaying the announcement is like we're trying to get all the commissions on board and go out and educate them and let them know why, hey, this is the right thing to do. I mean, Andy Foster is a huge proponent of this, right? He talked in that meeting about what a pain in the ass it is to be spinning your wheels on these cases where you know you're not looking at intentional dopers and cheaters. Um, so he doesn't want to do that, and, and we don't want to do that. Just assume that if he never broke the news, we would never have known about this? Probably. I mean, again, the, the reason that we did that, and hey, it, it's on me. You want to get as much transparency, I think, as you can in an anti-doping program, but when that impedes on you know the fairness and due process of an athlete, and that's unfortunately something that we saw. We saw positive tests early on where we'd announce them right away, then that athlete's labeled as a cheater, and it's hard to reel back in that headline. Headline on the front page, retraction on the back, right? So, you know, we changed that. We saw that that was an issue, and yeah, so, I mean, had Nate not talked about it, it wouldn't be out there. But, and in fact, I was talking to a, to a prominent manager this week about that, and he said, man, his term was, what a gangster move by Nate. And I'm like, no kidding. Like, if you're really not doing something on purpose and you're told, look, this isn't going to get out there unless you talk about it and you go out and talk about it anywhere, anyway, I mean, you talk about proof in the pudding for what you know kind of guy he is. I mean, he's legit when he talks about you know anti-steroid and plant-based whole foods. I mean, all the supplements he was using, on the face at least, look very, very benign. They're all organic, plant-based. You know, that you buy at Whole Foods, Costco, whatever. Yeah. Is there any way to try to educate the guys? Yeah, what great question. So another part of our revision of the new policy is we are going to now have much more clarity in supplements. So one of the biggest questions that Donna Marcolini, who works with me and I, get is what are the USADA approved supplements? And to date, our answer is, well, Technically, there's no USADA approved. Here's the ones they recommend, and then the next question is, well, what if I use that and something happens? And we say, well, no guarantee. Once we see, once say that, everything else we say goes in one ear and out the other, because they want to hear approved. We are going to have approved supplements going forward when we make this announcement. We've identified several third-party certifiers, and under the UFC program, those will be approved. Should anything happen to a fighter as a result of using those, it's a, it's a virtual get-out-of-jail-free card. Now, they may have to sit out if it's you know their levels are over a certain amount if they do get a performance enhancing benefit but there'll be no repercussions I think that's going to make a huge difference um, Major League Baseball does something like that they only allow these certified supplements into the clubhouse and I mean they have the advantage over us here because the team shows up to work every day where we have athletes spread amongst almost 50 countries um, but since they instituted that that only these you know they use NSF for sport only those are allowed in the clubhouse I mean, their rate of positive tests has gone, have gone down significantly. And they have the major sports. Now, I don't think they're as good as ours, but they have the best program in the major sports. Baseball or? Ours should be next week. Next week? Yep. It's going to be a full list? Yep. Wow. So there will be thousands of sub. I mean, I think right now we've identified four third-party certification companies. If you add up all the supplements they certify, more than a thousand, and they're available worldwide. And they'll be public? It will be public, yep. And in terms of like the, the get out of jail free, quote unquote, yep. you still need to test that supplement, right? Absolutely. Okay, you still have to still need to find hey, it now. Here. Unless they were under the threshold. So right. now under the threshold, look, it's always ideal, in this case was, to find the culprit, to find where it came from. But in the case where you can't, and again, we, we just upped our testing numbers by 1,500 tests a year this year. So we're getting so many data points. You know, rarely now do we see a case where an athlete hasn't been tested in the last month or two. Um, so again, that's a benefit to the clean athlete. You want more testing on you. It protects you ultimately, potentially. What is the annual budget for testing? Multi-million dollars. Yeah, it's not a cheap program, and you know that's that's a tough thing in anti-doping. But you know, you look at MMA, and I get all these you know regional, local promoters saying like, "Man, I'd love to have this program, but like, shoot, I can't, I can't afford it." 
One thing I think is positive in here that we're seeing is that trickle-down effect because most normally the path to the UFC is that last-minute injury replacement, right? You get a call from Sean or Mick two weeks out, so-and-so has fallen off, you want a contract. If you're not clean at that point and haven't been clean, your, pro your first test potentially could be a positive one, and that includes not only purposely not doing things, but making smart supplement choices. So I think, you know, as I talk to managers, and it's, it's been a little bit of a slow process, but that's percolating out there, and I think we're seeing the rest of MMA cleaned up a little bit because of this program. In Q3, Sean O'Malley was tested like 10 times. Where's his case at right now? Yeah, still, I mean, uh, he's still pulsing um, with that substance. And, you know, again, that just pays even more attention to this issue that, you know, here you've got a fighter, which there's no evidence he did it on purpose. He obviously knows he's being tested all the time. To think that he would continue to be doing this is crazy. He's as careful as you can get right now. But, you know, again, these laboratories have gotten so good that they can detect things in the body for, shoot, in his case, a year. John Jones, the whole M3 picogram metabolite, two and a half years it was showing up in his system. That, that scares the hell out of me, you know, because how are you going to prepare a regional or a local show fighter for two and a half, three and a half years to be clean before he gets to the UFC? And again, that's yet another reason why we instituted these thresholds. In the UFC, sorry, the UFC signed Amir Ali Akbari, who had a history of uh, positive drug tests. He was tested once by USADA, and now Brave has come out and said that he's fighting there. What happened with him? Um, so he was the he's the Iranian mm -hmm. fighter. Yeah, so he had I mean he was sanctioned by his, uh, his wrestling federation And so under our program we looked at you know the rules and said hey, you're still under sanction I think you got a lifetime ban. Yeah, was it? Um, yeah, so um, I mean I guess yeah I, I, I wasn't aware that he actually was tested once in our program and I mean that may have been one where it fell through the cracks initially and they got a test on him because I mean, he didn't compete for us because we identified that he was under a lifetime ban and we would you know adhere to any other um, sanctioning bodies like that for a, for a sanction like that. So he's not under UFC contact now then? No. And he's not, he hasn't been sanctioned by USADA or anything? Nope, like has not. Nope. Still a little bit confused on yeah. inhaling <laughs> Did Greg do something wrong? Yeah, so look, in, in my world, and in Kevin, I only tweeted something out, um, in the USADA world, no. So that substance is allowed at all times, in and out of competition, as long as you keep it under a certain level. So I think it's 800 uh, micrograms per 12 hours. Each puff of an inhaler is 90. So, I mean, unless you're, you know, puffing a dozen times, you're going to stay under that. Now, the other issue, obviously, is the commission issue, and I think we all saw on tape that he asked the inspector, who's part of the commission, could he do this, and the inspector said yes. So, but my understanding is technically you can't do that, and the inspector, inspector was misinformed. So, why is there no contest? I think because he used that substance, it's, it's, I guess, against the rules of the commission, is my understanding. It's a little bit outside of my realm. I mean, maybe more of a Mark Ratner question than mine. I don't think so. I mean, you know, I think it would be okay, and most commissions would be okay with you taking a puff in the back before you walked out, but I don't think your any commission allows any substances other than, you know, water, bottled water inside the cage. Um, he, well, Greg actually, when he onboarded into this program, cleared it through Donna and I. He declared it to every time he's fought, including uh, before the commission. So, look, he wasn't, the evidence is he wasn't trying to hide anything. And so, he, since his next fight is, is not in the U.S., it's in Moscow, will he be allowed to? No, but, I mean, because we'll self regulate and have yeah. the same rules. I think we follow, like, Nevada's rules. Okay. Um, so, no, he wouldn't be allowed to use it. Just to be, just to be clear, Jeff, that it's not an anti doping situation at all. Correct, it's not an anti doping situation. It's, it's more about commission, commission rule, regulatory, yep. in fight. Rule, exactly. Right. All right. Thanks, guys.